This episode is brought to you by Pocket Paragons. At fewer than 10 cards per player, it is the dive kick of card games. And in acknowledgement of that, I will make this the dive kick of commercials. Link in the description below. Ah, les starter deck. Les first impression des jeux de cartes. Si est plus noble dans l'esprit de subir les fronts et les flèches and and enough of these stupid French accents. <coughs> Welcome to Playing Around, the follow-up series to the seven deadly trading card game Sins, where we look at common features and mechanics in game design. The starter deck is likely someone's first impression of a trading card game. Whether they learn about it through a cartoon or via the internet, the starter deck is likely when they will get to actually touch and feel their very own cards for the first time, so it pays to get it right. The closest I think the industry has ever gotten to perfection is the Duel Masters Blue Box. Some have tried to imitate it, none have come close. It stands as my gold standard for now. So what exactly constitutes the perfect starter deck? While there are a variety of ways to approach this question, there are definitely things that can be marked down as wrong answers, which I will go over. Whether it goes by the name starter, trial, structure, or base, in short, a good starter deck is three things. Affordable, approachable, and inspirational. Now those first two kind of work together as an affordable starter is inherently an approachable starter as I detailed in my accessibility video, but let me break it down. For the longest time, the standard price for starter decks was a flat $10, just like how booster packs were four. Now with inflation, this has gone up a bit, but there was a time where games thought they could get away with charging way more. Some like Shadow vs Evolve and Alternate Souls had the nerve to charge 30, and I find not a lot of people talk about those much anymore. I mean, going by my LCG video, that's three Yu-Gi-Oh decks worth. Actually, now that I think about it, have Yu-Gi-Oh decks gone up in price? Oh man, there goes my standard unit of measure. You need to remember that a starter deck is meant to be a loss leader, an anchor that is used to sell additional products later on where the real profit happens. Games like Pokemon tailor special products like collector boxes and tins to tie into their starter decks as an obvious jumping off point, so a lower profit on a starter deck is not only tolerable, it's desirable. If your starter deck costs more than about $13 US, it better have a darn good reason as to why. Another thing to keep in mind is repeat purchases. If your decks are designed to encourage more than one deck purchase, a low price is important here as well. Hats off to Disney Lorcana for expecting people to shell out for four decks at 17 a pop. That's six and three quarter Yu-Gi-Oh decks by the old standard for those paying attention at home. And oh boy, don't get me started again on Dungeons & Dragons Onslaught, whose starter set is 14 Yu-Gi-Oh decks. The whole point of people not wanting to spend a lot of money on something they don't know if they like or not was completely lost on them, I guess. There was actually a brief period of insanity during COVID times where decks could be as low as $5 each in Japan. Here in the US, Pokemon has streamlined their packaging to drop down to 10 bucks again for the first time in a long time. Lorcana gave them that inch after all. The only time we really see starters jump above 13 is when they are a two player starter like the blue box. A single purchase for two players is a common way to introduce a game quickly, like how Magic does it these days, though there is a history of games like Pokemon and Neopets doing the same with half decks designed to get two players started, but which can combine into a single game legal deck when shuffled together. But these can also be overdone. Universes introduced their two-player starter set in an awkwardly shaped fancy box for 30 bucks. Also Munchkin, which suffered from, well, bad box designitis. But now we're getting more into product design, which I do love to gush over. You know me and my boxes. So let's move ahead from that and discuss approachability. A good starter product should be as easy to use as possible. This is usually the focus of my how this game gets you to buy their starter decks videos, so let's break down that box. As I say in those videos, it's important to get these right. The front of your box should get someone to walk over and pick it up. 
This uses attention-grabbing artwork and design, made to appeal to the sort of player that person is, drawing them from across the room to take a look. After they pick it up, they're going to want to turn it over to see what it's about. The back needs to make them want to buy it. This is where so many boxes fail my smell test. The backs are so often marked up with nothing. No keen artwork, no card reveals, no hype dialogue to make me want to play, just a bland component list, a company logo, or just nothing. Come on, bro, this is like the back cover of your novel, dude! You're paying for this real estate, tell them how cool your game is! Tell them! Tell them! As for the contents themselves, they need to convince your buyer that they made the right choice. Me personally, I prefer boxes that you do not have to destroy in order to open them, so I can close them and keep them on display, but I can understand the desire for something tamper evident so people don't buy your starters, take out the contents, refill them with rocks, and attempt to return them for a refund. But if you want to make your box tamper evident, please, please put the perforation to open the box on the back of the hang tag. That way the hang tag can be folded down and back into the box to hold it shut. Tamper evident and reusable, the best of both worlds. Other games improve this by including a storage tray, deck box, or in the case of Pokemon, both. In the case of expandable card games, your starter boxes being straight up effective card storage is a common approach. If people carry stuff branded with your game around with them, that's free advertising, yet another efficient use of real estate. Along with the deck itself, the box should also contain a way for a player to access both the rules and the playmat at the same time. This is one of my best known pet peeves in game design, and that is printing the rules on the back of the playmat. A lot of games, including those made by major publishers for some reason, keep making the same mistake over and over again, to which I, again, point out the obvious problem. What am I supposed to do with this part? I don't know, let me check the rules. Oops. Yeah. The most common solution to this problem is to simply print the rules separately, whether in book or sheet form, so the rules can be consulted at any time. But if you simply must print the rules on the back side of the playmat due to some sick compulsion or something, there are two options. Either print a two-player playmat or include two mats from the start. That way, between two players each providing their own deck, there's a surface to play on and a set of rules to consult. Other games put trivia on the back of their playmats, a sort of deck tutorial or tip guide to consult before playing. These are fine as they are more advice than rules, or you can leave it blank. No shame in doing that. Another trend I've noticed is using QR codes as links to rule books, and I'm sorry, no, I do not want to slowly scroll through a tiny book on my tiny phone screen at the mercy of the local Starbucks Wi-Fi. If you are using QR codes, make them link to like how to play videos and FAQs instead, but include a printed set of rules that I can easily consult. And as for the deck itself, there are a number of approaches as well, but generally a good idea is to make a deck that is actually slightly imperfect. There is no shame in including some filler cards that are clearly meant to be replaced with something better. Obvious choices can make learning easier after all. So yeah, I know a lot of people complain about when a starter deck contains cards that aren't really necessary for the deck, but guys, these cards are there for the newbies so they can figure out what cards to take out when they start customizing their deck, okay? They're not for you. A lot of decks have cards with incomplete playsets, not only making it easier to approach, but opening up people to buying more than one deck. Which, again, I don't think is a sin. A common mistake I see, especially in Japanese games, is building decks where you get a full playset of everything. While it does make it easier to get full collections, it sort of removes that easy place to spot holes meant to be filled or consider places to tweak ratios. We Cross is one of those games loaded up with full playset and that removes the need to buy another deck, meaning my local store has zero booster packs and loads of starter decks that nobody needs. Lifting the cap on buying starter decks is fine and even encouraged, but keep it manageable, like no fewer than one third playset per deck. Actually, I was looking at this and I just noticed that Lorcana actually doesn't include a single full playset of anything. 
Wow, $17. If you're making a non-random card game like an XCG, it should go without saying that full playset is a necessity. I went off about Fantasy Flight not doing this so hard that they literally changed their entire business model three whole days before my video about them came out. It was that powerful. As well, the deck should be purpose-built. The eras of random half-decks and surprise decks sold as starters are long over. People want a more curated experience, and your starter deck should include one or more synergies to let players fully uncover and grasp. Like, this deck comes with this card, like, Scorched Earth, which lets me discard a fire energy to draw cards, and it also has this card, Blacksmith, that, like, lets me play fire energy from my discard pile. So one card puts energy into the discard pile, and another one uses energy from the discard pile, so wait, does that mean that these cards are supposed to... <laughs> A good starter is one with room for growth, but that also lets the player feel like that they've really grasped something about the game by interacting with it, firing up combos and really seeing what the game is going for. Which leads us to the cherry on top. The single best thing to include in any starter deck is, as always, a booster pack. This is probably the single best door opener you can have in the world of starter decks. A booster pack is an immediate value. Players will calculate it against the cost of a deck, which increases affordability. It helps accessibility, as if the player wasn't too keen on the deck they got, maybe they'll find something in the booster pack that interests them. And of course, it might even open up their first deck customization if they got some relevant cards inside. This actually reminds me of something. A while ago, I did a video about Grand Archive and how it's stupid to put these weird signature rares in a scant few starter decks. And this is coming from somebody who actually pulled one first try, so good luck trying to blame this on sour grapes. What these are is a crude effort to remove the sales cap on starter decks completely, despite the fact that there is already no theoretical limit to booster pack sales, and I really am not a fan. Now, of course, people countered with the idea that a new player getting a card like this will create a special memory for them. But you know what else will do that? Getting a super rare card in their bonus booster pack. Like, could you imagine buying a Digimon starter and pulling Omnimon? That is some people's lived experience. So yeah, these cards are gross. Stop it. Special cards like first edition Machamp are fine. Many famous cards are, but they should be at one to one odds. And yeah, I know Grand Archive are technically not the ones to start this. It was game company Mino like with some of their stuff, but either way, it's just it's just not good. So, to summarize, a good starter deck has appealing and reusable packaging. It features a deck that is imperfect but functional and a setup that keeps all important information at a hand's length. A booster pack is the cherry on top to be a window into the wider game world rounds out the experience. So let's review with my little gold standard, the Dual Masters Blue Box. The Blue Box is maybe not the most functional design, but it does have the tray and window in front to catch our attention. Some flashy holofoil along with an exciting blurb and even a contents list that's super exciting. It's got play decks, a comic book, and a D-Max membership offer. You bet I took that offer. It's how I got my slick binder. The deck itself is a single-player 40-card deck that splits into a pair of practice decks. A swarmy, aggressive red deck and a high-power defensive yellow deck, both with splashes of green. It also includes a comic book to get you excited about the world, a quick start guide to get you playing, a pair of playmats, a full rulebook, and of course, a bonus booster pack. If I have to give it any faults, it would be the awkward box shape and the fact that you only get one pack in a box meant for two players, but the box makes up for it with the combined three color deck. There's an obvious way to work things out, right? You can pick a color to slim down and make room for new cards out of the pack. And you might pull something cool. Pretty solid. Of course, we couldn't end this without the decks that fall laughably short of the bare minimum. 
like the Epic Battles Tekken 5 starter deck, which includes a deck of 60 cards. How many do you need to play? 61. Uh oh. Beast Clans, a big old double deck box with nothing on the back and short and energy card for the Scorpion deck. Uh oh. Neopets, it's got a structure like the blue box, but one big flaw, not enough cards to actually play. This time short four cards instead of just one. Uh oh. Ophidian 2350, which contains the uncommon and rare equivalent of three booster packs for the cost of less than three booster packs. Why do we buy booster packs again? Aww. LOL surprises, quote unquote, starter pack, just being three random boosters crammed into a box. <laughs> the way Meta X advertises learning with Wonder Woman when Wonder Woman isn't in any of these starter decks, which are random, by the way. Oh. And of course, Redekai, whose starter decks cost $18 and are illegal to play without a further $35 purchase. But of course, let's also praise the little things. The way Mega Man NT Warrior includes a different character on its playmat so you can try something new right away. The way Pokemon's insert snaps shut to keep the tokens and things contained. The way Bandai decks limit you to two copies max if you want full playset. The way you can get into competitive Yu-Gi-Oh for like 30 bucks. The way some indie games like Varia make their starter boxes be straight up card storage. So yeah, at the end of the day, the perfect starter deck is, paradoxically, one that is imperfect. It's one that delivers on the experience on the game, but one that leaves you itching for more, making you want to get into deck building and more thoughtful play while giving the players the tools to start their journey. Keep these things in mind and you too can build a better card game. Join us next time on Playing Around. Hey, yeah, uh, thanks again for watching. I know this one took a little while and it also mentions a video called Accessibility, which did not come out before this one because the stuff needed to finish this one arrived first. But uh, rest assured, that one script is uh, recorded and we're getting on that. Also, a big thanks to my uh, biggest Patreon subscribers, Cleeclo, Wine Dark Sea, Chris Solis, Danny Bound, Dumpless, Echo Echo, Esquire S, Ilfinity, John Dolan, Justin Hartsock, Universe of Legends, Vaughn, and Worms Kodak, along with all of my $5 patrons as well. You guys, uh, you guys really mean the most to me. Um, I actually put a little behind the scenes video on my Patreon this time of me unboxing this blue box. So uh, have fun enjoying that. So yeah, until next time, this is Kodak signing off.